Great, so we are about to start before uh, I introduce the next uh, uh, lecturer. Let me remind you to check uh, frequently the uh, program for the next two days. So in particular, tomorrow we are gonna have um, a colloquium by Ned Wingreen on uh, uh, modeling microbial diversity. And I uh, strongly uh, suggest uh, to, to attend uh, the, that activity. Um, Again, a reminder, if you go on the website in the program, you will find a link to register to the separate uh, Zoom um, meeting. Uh, so follow the link, register, and you can follow it. And you can also follow it from YouTube if you don't want to use Zoom. Then tomorrow, there will be the first of three round tables on um, the pandemic, also with an interface uh, with uh, uh, economics. We have uh, in a great set of uh, panelists. And then on Thursday, we will have uh, um, the last three lectures and the two round tables. So uh, just to uh, remind you what to expect from the round tables, this is gonna be a sort of free informal discussion between the panelists, and there will be uh, time for you to ask questions, to express your opinion. So it aims at being a, a informal conversation. With that said, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce again uh, Alvaro Sanchez, who is giving the second of three lectures on uh, uh, the assembly and evolution of microbial community. So thank you, Alvaro, for being with us. And uh, when you're ready, you can uh, uh, share the screen and start the presentation. I think you're muted. Am I, am I muted? Um, can you hear me okay now? Yes, perfect. Perfect, perfect. Um, okay, so let me see if I can move this here. There you go. Um, okay, so I'm going to continue um, what I started yesterday and, and tell you about this work we're doing in our, in our lab to try to understand the, the rules that govern the assembly of complex microbial communities uh, using enrichment cultures. And I just wanted to um, before, before I get into today's um, material, I wanted to just give you a brief summary of, of yesterday's most salient points, just to emphasize what the basic results are and what it is that we're trying to explain. So a, a big question that I'm very, very fascinated with is uh, this idea of how reproducible microbial community assembly is. And um, this is a question that can be explored in natural systems. And in fact, it has been explored in natural systems. I give you uh, an example of um, this, this one among many, but this, this one is particularly interesting, I believe, is a work by Stiganos Loca and Michael Dobley and other collaborators where they were examining the assembly of microbial communities in these uh, water tanks that form within the base of, um, of the foliage of bromeliad uh, plants. And um, again, these are tropical plants. I think this particular study was done in Brazil, looking at uh, water tanks in plants that are in close proximity to one another so that, um, that you know, many of the physical components of the environment are shared among those habitats, temperature, humidity, et cetera. And, uh, and also the same regional pool of species. So when these folks looked at the microbiome of these different plants, um, they found that they did not contain, uh, that they, they were very variable right, from plant to plant. And most of the plants, uh, most of the OTUs were, uh, were uh, absent from, from each other and only about 1% or less of, the, of all the OTUs um, were shared among all plants. So there was a lot of variation within at the species level in these microbiomes. Yet when they looked at the metagenome and they examined the abundance of, uh, of different uh, genes involved in non-metabolic pathways, they found that the fraction of the, of the metagenome devoted, for instance, to fermentation, to respiration, to carbon fixation, uh, nitrogen respiration, and so on and so forth, uh, those were very, uh, very consistent from plant to plant. Right? And they found very similar quantitative ratios 
of these metabolic functions in all of these habitats, despite the fact that they find substantial taxonomic variation across them too. And this, uh, I also mentioned that this same finding has been made in, in a wide range of other habitats. They, it's been made in marine environments, in the human microbiome, in adult communities, and, uh, and the list is long. And uh, however it is difficult in natural habitats to disentangle uh, what are the mechanisms that are underlying these, uh, this phenomenon. The, there's many ecological forces that shape the assembly of micro communities. Some of them are governed by chance, such as mutations, uh, the arrival of species into a habitat or, um, uh, or, or dispersal. Uh, there's other ecological processes that are more deterministic, such as selection, uh, which we would expect to be a force that will generate more homogeneity in community composition across habitats that are at least those that are very similar. Uh, and finally, you can also have the confluence of the two, which we can call historical contingency, um, and where uh, it is, you know, there's many uh, different mechanisms that can lead to historical contingency. One of them is environmental modification, which is that here when you have habitats that are very similar to one another, once they get colonized by bacteria, the metabolic activity of those bacteria will change the habitats in subtle, subtly different ways. And, um, and that will cause um, an inevitable uh, uh, level of historical contingency because when you have different taxa, different habitats getting colonized by different bacteria by random dispersal, those habitats that were originally very similar will become less and less similar um, as a function of time. So um, what we have next is that um, the problem to understand um, this, this question of, of, um, um, of reproducibility is that in addition to being many different uh, ecological forces that shape the assembly of micro communities, uh, we also have that um, the selective pressures that are present in, in most natural habitats are very difficult to, to know, right? We, we may infer them or we might um, try to, um, to guess what the selective pressure might be uh, through data or through just knowledge of the environment. But there are many different, uh, the, if, if you think about it, right, we, we really don't know uh, all of the physical and chemical and nutritional um, niches that might be occurring in a, particularly because they're so small, right? Many of these are molecular. Um, and, and really understanding in, in, in detail uh, what are the forces that shape um, selection in different habitats is something that is um, very, very difficult to do uh, in nature. So the approach that we follow in my lab is we're trying to ask if um, it is possible to study the process of microcommunity assembly um, in a synthetic, in synthetic habitats where we can know the selective pressures, um, we can know the chemical composition uh, of the, uh, and the nutrient composition of these habitats. We know exactly uh, what niches are we supplying, right? Uh, and we can also know for a fact what is the, 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 all of the spatial determinants of microcommunity assembly. We can fix them. Uh, we can know the temperature, the pH, and we can control all of these factors. And we can also control ecological factors and ecological processes that contribute to microcommunity assembly. We can control the, the, the rate of migration from the regional pool, we can control what is the composition of the regional pool, um, we can control to some extent the population size, the connectivity between habitats, and so on and so forth. So um, the question we're asking is if we know all of the things that we do not know or are very difficult to know in natural habitats, can we then understand uh, the mechan more mechanistically the origins for these patterns of convergence at the functional level but divergence at the taxonomic level that are found across a large number of natural habitats? Right, so that's what my lab is trying to do, and um, in other words, we're trying to more mechanistically understand uh, the reproducibility of micro community assembly. I, I gave you also an idea of what are the experiments and the experimental pipeline we're, 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 we're following in my lab. We're using um, high throughput enrichment communities. We, we take, uh, for our purpose, samples from the environment, for instance, we take soil samples, we stick that in a bottle with a water, uh, a water saline solution, uh, we filter. The, this, um, this to el eliminate all of the larger particles and we're left only with the bacteria. And then we sample from that large bottle of bacteria into a small um, um, miniature test tube and um, with a defined synthetic medium. 
and um, and here we are supplying the nutrients to the bacteria that are that we have a lot of control over. Um, in today's talk, those nutrients at, and, and, and the first part is going to be glucose. Later on, uh, we're gonna I'm gonna tell you about the, the results we get when we use other resources as well. And uh, what we do is that after we inoculate by random sampling from the from the original pool, we let the bacteria grow for a period of typically 48 hours. And after that period of growth, we apply a bottleneck. Uh, we take a small sample from here and add it to a new um, new, new little test tube where we replenish the nutrients and we let that grow again. And we keep iterating this process. And I showed you, uh, well, and every at the end of every um, 48 hour period, we are doing 16 sequencing to quantify the composition of different species in our communities. And I showed you also the results of a typical experiment. Uh, this is the relative abundance of different genera in one of these enrichment communities as a function of time, as a function of the transfer that we're looking into. Um, this is with relatively shallow sampling, uh, where if you think about it, we're just kind of sampling 10,000 10, random individuals from its community and, and identifying them. Right? So that's essentially what we're doing. And uh, the, the different colors here, each color represents a different uh, different genus, and uh, the, the width of this column represents the relative abundance of that genus in the community. As you can see in this plot, after uh, about um, maybe eight to nine transfers, community composition stabilizes and becomes quite constant uh, through time. So um, what we are asking here is, is how reproducible community assembly is. And, uh, and then the, the main question is, if we do the same experiment multiple times, do we find the identical outcomes? That is the, the ultimate question we're asking. So uh, to answer it, we, what we have done is that we have inoculated multiple replicate communities from the same regional species pool. And uh, we, we can take um, say eight different test tubes, we fill them all with the same, um, with the same uh, medium, right? We put them in the same incubator and we inoculate them from the same uh, species pool. And what we find is that when, after we propagate those eight communities in identical environments for um, um, about 80 generations or so, 12 transfers, and we examine the, the com composition of these communities, uh, we have found two things. So one is that we see very strong convergence uh, at the family level, right? All of these wells contain essentially this, uh, very similar ratios of the two main dominant families. Uh, but very um, much more variable community assembly when you look at it at taxonomic level of genus or lower, right? So this is reminiscent to what we have uh, observed before in, in these studies that was mentioned before, right? There's a lot of variation at the species level, uh, but um, a lot less variation and much more convergence at the level of family. Uh, well, the, what they were saying actually is in families is function, right? So our, our idea is that perhaps the two are connected, right? That this family level Convergence that we're observing uh, is reflecting um, a convergence at the functional level too. And uh, just to give you a, a, an idea of uh, what this looks like when we repeated uh, our experiment uh, with 12 different regional pool species, um, what we find is that the, this is across uh, 12 different inocula, eight replicates for each, and I'm plotting the family level composition of the communities for all of those experiments. Uh, what you can find is that there's a, a very strong uh, reproducibility. Most of them have uh, are dominated by the same two dominant families. In blue, it's Enterobacteriaceae. In red, Sulmonadaceae. You have other more rare families that are, appear in some but not other of the, of the communities. And um, even the quantitative ratios of these two are quite similar. I just wanted to give you another example of, of this kind of phenomenon of family level convergence. And this is work uh, by my colleagues at the Connecticut Agricultural Station, uh, Steve Blair uh, and, 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 and Charles Zhang. And what you, you find in this, in this study, what they did is they looked at community assembly in the stigma of the flowers of the uh, apple tree. And they looked at the communities that assembled on uh, about 100 different flowers. And one of the things they found is that, uh, again, they find a uh, fairly consistent uh, community assembly in, uh, in, in these habitats at the, at the family level of taxonomy with Enterobacteriaceae again in blue and, and Sulmonadaceae in red, um, which are found in, across all of these uh, flower communities. Yet they find a lot of variation at the species level. If you look at the 
um, the different OTUs within the and the and the OTUs within interactive easy, you find that even though at the family level, these communities are very similar from one another, um, they contain different specific members of each family, right? So this result, again, is consistent with this, uh, with this pattern. But in this case, again, they're finding this, this pattern not at the level of function, but at the level of family, which is what we did. And I'm just uh, plotting uh, these two things side by side so you can get a, an idea of, of how the results are. Well, of course, they're not identical, but this, these environments are very different, right? We're talking about a flower uh, and a, um, and a um, sugar-based synthetic medium. It's uh, interesting because the, um, we think that the environment that this microbes are experiencing in the flower is, at least the nutritional environment, is not that different from what we find in our, in our experiments. Anyway, well, this is all is painting a picture that, that um, presents a number of questions. So the first one is, why do so, so many species coexist on a single limiting resource? And this was the subject of yesterday's um, this, this lecture. Um, second um, is, um, we, what we need to understand is, why is community assembly so convergent at the family level? Uh, again, in our experiments, we're observing family level convergence. In, 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 in others, they from functional level convergence, right? So we, uh, we need to uh, try to understand that better mechanistically. And in tomorrow's lecture, I will be talking about um, why community assembly is so variable at the species or genus level. Um, and again, this was yesterday's, and that's going to be uh, today. Okay, so today's, uh, what, I, what I wanted to, to, to go through is the work we've tried to do. I, I, I try to understand why, why we're finding these results. Why do we see a community assembly so convergent uh, at the family level? And um, Matching this for the results that I will, I've been um, you know, hammering to you to yesterday and today, uh, our, our first guess is that this is actually reflecting some form of functional convergence. Right? Um, and, uh, and, and to test that idea, what we did is very simple. We took um, 13 or 14 of these, we can't remember the, number, the exact number of, of the communities that we had, uh, I had shown you before that we had assembled in, in glucose and as the only uh, carbon source, right? So we took those communities and we, we did uh, dilutions and we spread them over um, agarose petri dishes. And we spread them at, at very low uh, densities of cells so that we could, um, uh, it, when cells would grow on, on these petri dishes, they would form little colonies and cells from different species form colonies that are different from one another, right? So we could take those, um, those colonies, then we, 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 we sequence their uh, ribosomal uh, DNA to, um, to, to understand who they were, what was their, uh, their identity, and compare those with the 16S um, uh, ribosomal RNA sequence that we had previously obtained from uh, community level 16S sequencing. And the two matched very nicely, so we were able to isolate a large number of the members of uh, 13 different communities uh, for a total of around 100 different pseudomonadesia and interactive easy strains, right? So we were able to take the members of those communities and separate them, right? And grow them in, in, in isolation uh, from the community where they were isolated. And what we did then is that we, the first thing we, we wanted to do is we wanted to ask whether the pseudomonadesia and enterobacteria, which is these two families, uh, would differ at the family level in the growth rate in glucose. I remind you that glucose is the only carbon source we're supplying and that enterobacteria is about uh, two to three times more abundant than pseudomonadesia in our communities. So we wondered if that was because enterobacteria is actually better at growing in glucose than pseudomonadesia is. And uh, so what we did is that we took each one of those isolates and we grew them on media containing, that is exactly the same medium uh, where our community had been assembled. It is minimal media. For those of you who, know, who are knowledgeable about this, this is M9 medium with glucose as the only carbon source. And we determine the growth rate by, by, uh, by just looking at the growth curve uh, over a period of about 48 hours. We determine the maximum growth rate of the enterobacteria strains and the pseudomonadesia strains uh, individually. And we're plotting them here, right? And in blue, I'm showing the growth rate of the enterobacteria. In purple, I'm showing the growth rates of the pseudomonadesia. And as you can see, the um, enterobacteria grows better um, and reaches a higher growth rates than the pseudomonadesia as, as a family. So uh, what we find is that uh, at the family level, there's conservation in the growth rate of uh, in the supplied resource, right? which 
uh, may explain why so enterobacteriaceae is uh, observed at higher abundance than pseudomonadesia. The next thing we did though, is I, I told you yesterday that an important component of coexistence in our communities is metabolic cross-feeding, that the enterobacteriaceae, when they grow in glucose, they are known to secrete various metabolic byproducts, uh, including acetate, succinate, lactate, uh, as well as others. And these three are, uh, we use mass spectrometry to determine what are the most abundant byproducts. Uh, and these three are the ones that came out um, as being the dominant ones. And one of the things that is interesting is that um, we find that the pseudomonadesia here, I'm showing is the amount of acetate produced um, over a period of 48 hours as a function of time for our collection of isolates. And in blue, I'm plotting those results for the enterobacteriaceae and in purple for the pseudomonadesia. And you can see that as the enterobacteriaceae grows on glucose, the amount of acetate they produce, particularly after 16 hours, and this is the relevant time scale, and I'll tell you why in a minute, uh, is, is very con con conserved, right? All of these, all of these bacteria uh, produce very similar amounts of acetate in, our, in, in these habitats. Now, the reason why 16 hours is the most important time scale is because this is the time that it takes for glucose to be exhausted. Right? So um, what happens between this and that is that the single strains that are growing in isolation ended up then meta re, uh, metabolizing some of their secretions. And uh, in many cases we find, for instance, for, for citrobacter, uh, citrobacter, which is the, these guys that you see over here, that acetate secretion continues for a little bit longer. And that's probably a byproduct of organic acid uh, metabolism because uh, the, the glucose has been exhausted by that time. But so at the relevant time scale, which is what happens with the glucose when they consume it, is that all of these, bacteria, all of these enterobacteria produce very similar amounts of, um, of acetate, right, which is the dominant uh, metabolic byproduct. They also produce similar, though, though less so, um, amounts of succinate and lactate. And uh, what you can see is that there's a conservation uh, on, of uh, quantitative niche construction for all of these spe species of enterobacteria over um, uh, with respect to, uh, by comparison with the pseudomonads. And what's more is that we find that the, when you, when you, it is, it, when you plot the amount of acid that is being produced as a function of the maximum growth rate that these bacteria can, can attain, you find that there's a, a fairly strong correlation between the two. And this is something that has been documented before for other enterobacteria such as E. coli and, and Salmonella, which is what, that the faster they grow, the more acid they release. Right? And, and that is because um, more and more of their metabolism is shifted to fermentation rather than respiration, even though it's, well, it's really called overflow metabolism. Um, but uh, more, more of that of their metabolism kind of stops at acetyl CoA and then leads to pyruvate fermentation and, and secretion of acetate. And, and less and less of the, uh, of the glucose flow is directed to TCA cycle and to full respiration. So what that leads is that the faster bacterium needs to grow, the more overflow we'll have to, to do. And that leads to uh, a strengthened secretion of acetate and other organic acids, the faster these bacteria grow. And that is also observed, this is, this, each point represents a different strain. This has for many different uh, genera of the enterobacteriaceae, including Rabutella, Citrobacter, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, uh, Serratia, uh, and others. And, and you can see that this, this kind of uh, trade-off between yield and growth rate is uh, applicable to uh, broadly to all of the strains of enterobacteriaceae, regardless of, uh, of, of the specific species or, or genus they are. Uh, by contrast, Pseudomonas doesn't uh, engage with that as is known, right? That overflow acetate production by overflow metabolism is, is not uh, uh, documented to, have, to occur in Pseudomonadesia, which is uh, primarily a respiratory bacterium. Um, okay, so um, it is believed that this, this trade-off emerges from physiological constraints in protein allocation, but that's a subject that is beyond the scope of this talk. Um, but the point I wanted to make with this slide is to illustrate that this, this emerging picture from the two um, slides I've shown you before. First is that the glucose is selecting for fast growers on, and strong growers on glucose. And the faster, uh, and we find that enterobacteria grow faster than pseudomonadesia. And we find that the faster these the cells grow, the more acid they produce, right? So strong uh, selection for fast glucose gro growers leads to, um, to uh, bacteria secrete organic acids, 
and uh, which do so, the, the amount of distributions are relatively similar. I guess the variation you see here on the y-axis is not that high, right? It's around 10 plus minus five. Um, and, uh, but also we find that that leads to the secretion of organic acids in a manner that is correlated with the amount of, um, of growth you have. And the next thing we did is we repeated those first measurements uh, of growth rate for all the other dominant fermentation byproducts that are released by the, by the um, enterobacteriaceae, acetate, succinate, and lactate. And what we find is that in this case, the enterobacteriaceae grows uh, on average less well on those byproducts than the pseudomonadesia uh, does, right? And so we find that both for, for acetate, succinate, and lactate, the pseudomonas grows faster on average than the enterobacteriaceae. So we also find that in addition to there being a, a, a phylogenetically conserved growth of the bacteria in, um, in the supplied resource, where enterobacteria grows better than the pseudomonadesia in glucose, there's a convergence in each construction. And there's also a convergence um, at the level of growth in the byproducts of glucose metabolism, where in this case, the pseudomonadesia grows better than the enterobacteria. And um, I just wanted to show you um, this. Um, this is for the evidence for this thing I'm trying to tell you. Let me see if I can move this here. Um, what, uh, what we find here is I'm showing for a specific community, the concentration of glucose as a function of time and the ratio between uh, pseudomonas and enterobacteria. And this RNF uh, ratio will, I will explain in a minute, but this is the ratio of pseudomonas to enterobacteria, right? So you find, we see that um, glucose is depleted and after 21 hours, there's none. Uh, we actually, it's, it's a little bit earlier than that, but you know, in this plot, uh, we, there's what we quantified. Um, and acetate uh, goes up as glucose is being depleted, peaks at around 21 hours, and then drops to zero after 48 hours for this one community. Um, and at the same time, we find that the ratio between pseudomonas and enterobacteria declines uh, in this first phase when glucose is being depleted. Uh, and this is consistent with the idea that the enterobacteria are consuming the glucose. Right? Um, and after the, in the last uh, uh, 20, you know, 23 hours or so, uh, 27 hours or so, you find that as the acetate is being depleted, the ratio of pseudomonas to enterobacteria in this community goes up, right? And that is consistent again with the idea that the pseudomonas are eating these organic acids primarily. I mean, again, this doesn't mean that none of the glucose is being eaten by the pseudomonas or none of the organic acids are eaten by the enterobacteriaceae. Uh, we have every reason to believe that actually both, have, both of those things are happening, but the primary consumers for the glucose um, is the enterobacteriaceae and the primary consumers for the uh, uh, organic acids are the pseudomonadesiae. We've done other experiments that confirm this point. We have truncated the growth time at 24 hours. And when you do that, and the pseudomonadesia goes away and the, the community becomes entirely dominated by the, by the enterobacteriaceae uh, and with organic acids that accumulate and no one eats them. Right? Um, so, so anyway, we, we have um, substantial evidence that that's what's happening in our communities. Uh, let me see if I can put this back in here. Um, all right, so let me give you a summary of what we think is happening in our, in our, uh, at the functional level. Uh, we have these communities that assemble into very similar ratios of these two dominant families, enterobacteriaceae in blue and pseudomonadesia uh, in red. And what's happening is that the enterobacteriaceae are being selected for by the glucose because they grow faster. Um, and as a one, one thing we observe is that the faster they grow, the more organic acids they produce. So uh, as these bacteria and enterobacteriaceae are growing on the, on the glucose, they are releasing organic acids like acetate, succinate, and lactate. And as they accumulate the environment in the, in, the, in the second half of the incubation time of this 48 hour period, the environment is no longer a glucose environment, it's primarily an organic acid environment. And in those environments, the pseudomonadesia has an advantage, right? And, uh, and that's what we're seeing it here. So the enterobacteriaceae um, are occupying a functional uh, niche, which is uh, that of respirofermentative bacteria that specialize in the glucose, whereas the pseudomonadesia are occupying a functional needs, which is that of respirative bacteria that specialize on organic acids. And uh, we call res this respirative uh, functional group R and, and respirofermentative group F. 
And the, the coexistence um, between these two groups is stabilized by a metabolic crossfitting um, that primarily goes from one direction to the other. Although that's only the first order effect. There's also, and we have evidence for that too, um, all other byproducts that have been released by both, right? So it's, it's not that we're saying that the only thing that happens is that the glucose goes entirely to one and not the other. We know that that is not true. Uh, we're just describing a first order effect and, and what is the primary consumer of each of the two reaches. All right, so um, all of this, what shows to you is that this family level convergence we have observed and does represent functional convergence, right? And, and it is so through the, the evolutionary conservation of the relevant functions for growth and fitness in our environments. Now, the next question we wanted to ask is whether it is possible to take this ratio between R respirators and F fermenters that we're seeing here and explain that quantitatively uh, from the known um, physiological and biochemical processes uh, that are occurring at the cellular level. So uh, again, um, we, we get a ratio between pseudomonas and enterobacteria that is around 0.27. Um, and that is uh, the ratio between respirators to fermenters in our ecosystems. And um, to see if it's possible to recapitulate that finding, what we have been doing is um, genome scale metabolic models uh, that are based on flux balance analysis. And I'm not gonna go into details of how FBA works, uh, but suffice it to say, this is a genome scale metabolic model where you could take um, a metabolic network as you can take, for instance, a metabolic network of a bacterium like E. coli, or you could make, as we did for this particular project, we built a super metabolic network that contains all of the known by, uh, metabolic reactions in prokaryotes and put them together into a big matrix. Um, and what you do then is we, you, you give that network an, an input, which is the, a set of nutrients. And with flux balance analysis, what you do is you calculate the uh, vector of metabolic fluxes that would optimize um, growth. And this is optimized a, a given biomass function that you give the model in, a, in that environment that you're supplying. And what FBA will do is we'll, we'll find what is the, the vector of fluxes that will maximize growth. And, and that vector of fluxes will give you an output, which is the amount of biomass produced per, per unit molecule consumed. You, you could put it away. Uh, and also an output, which is the byproducts that are released in the process of growing optimally on that substrate. So what we did then is we we looked at a um, we took two models, one uh, of an enterobacteriaceae and E. coli, and another one of a um, I think this is wrong. This is actually P. putida. Uh, it's a uh, another of um, of a pseudomonas, which is in this case P. putida. And what we did is is very simple. We took and calculated what it would be uh, per glucose molecule. Well, how much biomass uh, of E. coli would be produced, right? Um, and uh, how much acid it would be secreted. And now we took the, that, the acid that had been secreted and fed it to this model of PPTDA and calculated how much biomass uh, would PPTDA produce. And this was by taking basically these off the shelf models um, and, and evaluating their, their growth. And what we find with E. coli and PPTDA is the, the predicted ratio of, um, uh, of PPTDA to E. coli biomass per glucose molecule that enters this, this, this uh, trophic chain that we created uh, was actually around 0.3. Again, this is only true if all of the glucose goes to, to E. coli and, and, not, and all of the acid, acid it goes to a PPTDA, right? But even with these very simple assumptions, we, we get a ratio between um, um, PPTDA and E. coli that is very similar to what we found uh, before, uh, which is around uh, as being the, the average ratio of respirators to fermenter, which is 0.27. And we repeat the same exercise for um, a large number of uh, previously well-created models, metabolic uh, models for both um, uh, enterobacteriaceae and pseudomonalacea. And for, for each of those models, we calculated the, we did exactly the same exercise that I showed you before. And we calculated the ratio of biomass, uh, of the pseudomonas biomass to, enter, to, to enterobacteria biomass. And, um, the, 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 here we're plotting every possible pair of those 100 models. And you, you find that actually that value of 0.3 that we just found before is not an outlier. It sits very, very close to the average uh, ratio that we find between a, a pseudomonas and, and, and enterobacteriaceae biomass. And by comparison, we show you here the ratio of pseudomonas to enterobacteriaceae in all of our experiments. Uh, and the two are fairly close, right? 
this is really not a prediction per se. What we're trying to argue here is that one can explain these ratios um, from very simple uh, arguments. And uh, assuming that, you know, making the, the, the simplifying assumption that all of the glucose goes to into bacteria and, and all of the byproducts go to a, a pseudomonadasia. And when you do that, as some, that simple exercise, what you get is something that seems very similar to what we find um, in our experiments. Um, right, okay. So now the, the, the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, results that we've collected a, a while ago. Uh, and and it's, the, the, this paper is now being written at the moment. And where we did uh, the same experiments, but on a large collection of other sugars. And here the question was, okay, we, we found that this ratio of around 0.3 uh, of pseudomonas to enterobacteria or respirus to fermenters, um, and we find it for glucose, right? But uh, how different would it be if we had done used other sugars? What if we had used, I don't know, galactose, uh, which is another hexose or, or ribose, which is another sugar, in this case, a pentose, or, or any other sugar alcohol uh, like, like inositol, manitol, or glycerol, right? So, we did that experiment. We repeated the, the, this, this enrichment experiment that I've been discussing before uh, using two different inocula. Um, these were two different potted plants in, 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 in Josh's house. And um, from, that, from that soil, what we did is we established communities on environments that contain either one of these sugars in isolation. This, again, not all of them this mixed, but one at a time, right? And here on the, on the, on the x-axis, I'm plotting the identity of the, of the sugar we're, we're adding in. On the y-axis, I'm gonna plot the ratio between respirus um, and, and fermentative bacteria. Uh, this dashed line marks the average of the glucose communities that we had uh, seen in the, in, in, you have been showing you before. And this, this gray zone here is 95% uh, uh, dispersal around that mean for the data. Right, so when we, uh, when we plot this data uh, on this plot, what you find is that for all the sugars, the, um, we find a very similar metabolic structure, right? The, the ratio of respirators to fermenters are um, ex extremely close to the value that we found for glucose. Uh, well, there are some outliers, but by and large, the results are, are very, cons very consistent. And just as a control, we wanted to see if, okay, what if we don't use a sugar, right? What if we use a, a metabolite, a nutrient that cannot be easily fermented and, and would be more likely to be respired. And to that end, we used a collection of different organic acids, many of which are fermentation byproducts, but others are just, you know, uh, components of the TCA cycle. We also used some um, organic alcohols and a, and a bunch of other, uh, other nutrients. And, and repeated the same experiment from the same two inocula, but now we assemble them on each one of these uh, collection of, of nutrients. And what we find is that the ratio of respirators to fermenters when you do not use sugars is very different from what you get when you do use su sugars. And um, th this, this experiment is quite interesting. For instance, I, I think I particularly like this data. This here is pyruvate, which is an organic acid that sits uh, in between glycolysis and the TCA cycle, right? And, and it's kind of intriguing that, that you get something that is kind of a transition in between the, the, the kind of uh, ratio between respirators and fermenters that you see in the sugars and this cloud that you see here when you use organic acids. Okay, so uh, I guess this plot would make the case that when you have similar nutrients, you are expecting to see similar, um, similar community compositions. Um, but can we more quantitatively define what nutrient uh, similarity is. I mean, we, we're saying that sugars are similar and organic acids are similar to one another, uh, but I'm basically waving my hand so far, right? Uh, can, can we make a more precise definition of how similar uh, two, two different nutrients are? So uh, we, again, resorted to flux balance analysis. And what we're doing here is very straightforward. We're taking, a, um, again, our meta metabolic model and we're feeding it different nutrients, right? So for instance, we're feeding uh, one nutrient, and we're calculating the vector of metabolic fluxes, and we can plot this vector in, in that space of metabolic fluxes. And now we could take, and uh, through the same uh, metabolic network, I mean, we can, in this case, what we're doing is we're constructing a universal metabolic network that contains all of the biochemical reactions, uh, uh, metabolic reactions that are known. Uh, and we're asking what would be the optimal way to metabolize each nutrient, right? So this is the vector 
of metabolic fluxes for nutrient A, this is a vector of metabolic fluxes that would be optimal for another nutrient B, and the distance between the two uh, can quantify how different those two are, right? So if two nutrients are very similar, uh, then they're going to be metabolized optimally in very similar manners, right? Uh, and if they're very different, they're going to metabolize uh, in, in very different manners, right? For instance, glucose and galactose are metabolized very similarly, and they're going to give you a very small distance between the two, whereas glucose and, uh, I don't know, uh, leucine are going to be metabolized more differently, and um, they're going to give you a, a larger vector here, uh, a vector with, with larger uh, distance. Right, so the next thing we did is um, we, we took this library of carbon sources that we, had, that we had studied experimentally, and then we calculated the metabolic distance between all of them. And um, the first thing that, and then we did, did simple hierarchical clustering. And, and one of the things that was very reassuring is that the, the results we got from this exercise um, made a lot of sense. We find in this dendrogram that all the sugars are clustered together. Um, all the carboxylic acids and organic alcohols are, are also uh, 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 clustered together. We also find that within the, this, uh, these two groups, their structure, here you find in this, in this neighborhood around here, um, most of the hexoses uh, and all this gluco glucose containing um, uh, disaccharides. And here you find the most of the sugar alcohols and the, and the pentoses. And here's the same thing, right? In, in this um, cyan group over here, you find all the TCA cycle intermediates. These are organic alcohols and, and so on, right? So that there, even there is within this, the structure that makes sense, right? That, that one would expect perhaps that those nutrients would be more similar to one another or less. Um, right, so, so then what we ask is to what extent this similarity between carbon sources can predict quantitatively um, similarity in community um, assembly in those nutrients. And what we find is that, that it does actually do a, uh, do a very good job. So uh, here I'm showing you the composition of um, at the family level for uh, all of the sugar and sugar alcohols. Uh, here now in blue, you find the inter interactivesia, and in green, the pseudomonadesia. This orange guy here is alkaligenesia. Um, and if you compare that with the organic acids and the alcohols, you find that it's, it's quite different. Uh, in most cases, the interactivesia is gone, and this is dominated by, by respiratory bacteria like uh, pseudomonadesia, alkaligenesia, and others. But even within the sugars, the structure, in this first group that are, are made by glucose-like sugars, we find uh, very, only very rarely that you find uh, alkaligenesia. Whereas in, in this uh, other group of pentoses and, uh, and sugar alcohols, we find that alkaligenesia is much more common. Um, and in fact, it's interesting that here in galactose, when it isn't, uh, actually this, this is probably just a, a misclassification because of the, the nature of the hierarchical clustering algorithm because uh, the galactose is a hexose. Um, the same is true for the organic acids and the alcohols. Um, if you look at the, the TCA cycle intermediates, you find that all of them contain interactivesia here in blue. Um, and even within those, there's even structure. So this group here is formed by fumarate, mallet, and succinate, that they enter side by side in the TCA cycle. And all these three carbon sources recruit rhizobiasia, and they are the only ones that do, right? It's an endemic species for this group of carbon sources. Um, likewise, there's endemic species in this group here. Uh, Sphingomonadesia is, is not found anywhere else. And also there's a convergent uh, community composition uh, within uh, this other group as well. So now the question is whether the distance between nutrients can explain distance between composition at the family level. Uh, and what we decided to do is just plot one, one against the other, right? We can, uh, at the family level, you can also have the communities assembled in nutrient A uh, and the communities assembled in nutrient B, and you can calculate the the family level composition for both. And once you have both, you can calculate the distance between them, right? And when we did that, uh, we were plotting here the Euclidean distance in metabolic fluxes against the Euclidean distance in community composition. And uh, what we find is that uh, there is a fairly decent correlation between the two. And this is just a very crude um, measurement. I mean, we're trying, now trying to extract, uh, do more, smarter ways to extract information the simply plotting the entire distance uh, of the entire metabolic uh, space. Maybe that there are some components that are more telling of how different uh, two, two nutrients are, but simply the, the entire uh, distance of metabolic fluxes, and to see if, if there's more signal that can be extracted this way, but this is where we are at the moment. Uh, we've been also using uh, machine learning algorithms to, to see if it is possible to predict what's going to be the community is assembled in a new carbon source from a new um, um, uh, 
permanent new inoculum. So just very basic doing cross-validation at this moment. Uh, and, and what we find is that um, the, um, the, 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 for the families that are most represented, like Enterobacteriaceae and Pseudomonadesia, there's a very decent, um, the, the, this, the very simple machine learning mo model is capable of, um, of, uh, of predicting the um, family level composition. And the same is true for, uh, for function, which is even better, right? So if you now group the, the taxonomic uh, composition by whether they are fermentative or, or respirative bacteria, and, and again, you, you train a model with one inoculum, and uh, with a set of carbon sources, and then you investigate what would be the, the expected, um, the, the expected uh, community composition from another inoculum in, uh, in, in one of the carbon sources that you left out of the training set. What we find is that it is possible to measure fermenter um, to, we, we get results that are, are make, make sense, right? And, and, and that the model is predicted to some degree um, and I mean, this is all pr very preliminary work, but I just wanted to give you a sense of where we're going with all of this. All right, so what I wanted to tell you today is, is what we think are the reasons behind um, the fact that community assembly is so comprised on the family level. And um, what we had guessed that this could reflect a functional convergence because people had seen um, metagenomic convergence uh, when being by metabolic function, right? So we had. Our original guess was that the family level was uh, representing uh, the uh, evolutionary conservation of metabolic traits uh, that are functionally important in our, in our in our ecosystems, and that's why we're seeing the signal at the family level. But um, because our environments are so simple, one is capable of resolving these questions mechanistically, and that's what we've been trying to do. And we are finding that uh, when you have sugars, and not only glucose but any other sugar you find that there is a very predictable ratio of bacteria that are respirofermentative that are, um, that are found and they're specialized in the sugars. And there's another group that are respirative that specialize in, in consuming the byproducts released by the former. So um, one of the things that, that is interesting about this result is that when we tend to think of metabolic traits uh, in particular, the consumption of, of, of carbon source um, of, 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 of nutrients that are based on carbon. The previous work has found right, that this is um, a highly variable trait. This, it's a trait that is not supposed to be conserved at the family level. Right? So if, if you look at, um, uh, for instance, uh, by contrast, there's other metabolic traits like the usage of specific electron acceptors that are more, much more deeply conserved um, evolutionarily. And uh, I just wanted to give you one example, right? This is, this is um, an experiment that was done with the bacterium E. coli that um, was grown in, um, I'm sorry, I'm missing the reference here for some reason, um, that it was grown in, um, in a collection of different, um, different nutrients. And it was assessed whether E. coli could grow or not, right? And uh, these this authors took, a, I think it was 150 different strains of E. coli and close to 100 different nutrients. And they're just measuring whether growth or not growth in each one of those. I'm just zooming in because this, this plot is a, is a bit of a mess. But here you have, for instance, a subset of these, of these strains. And you have ser serin, raffinose, and sucrose, which are three different uh, nutrients. And as you can see, some of those strains can grow uh, on, on serin, but others cannot. And this can, the others cannot, right? The same thing is true for raffinose, sucrose, and, and, and most of these other carbon sources on this group here only seven of the carbon sources tested uh, were able to be used by all of the E. coli. Okay, so what this uh, suggests is that metabolic traits are typically thought of as being uh, shallow, right? And, and that it's easy to, for, for bacteria to gain or lose the ability to metabolize a specific substrate. Um, so that that's kind of seems to be contradicting what we found, right? That there's family level conservation of, of, this, of these metabolic traits. But I just wanted to, to bring up again that the, what we've been studying is not the, the ability of a microbe to use um, a substrate or not use it, but rather how good that microbe is at using it, right? We're measuring quantitatively how much uh, a bacterium can, how well a bacterium can grow in a given substrate and what byproducts are being released and how well those other bacteria can grow on those byproducts. It's not just that you can use glucose. In fact, we find that 
uh, glucose can be used by both enterobacteria and pseudomonadesia. It is how well you can grow on those that determine whether you're going to be found in that environment or not. Because again, um, as you may also uh, very intuitively think, um, that's because a species exhibits a trait. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that that trait is going to be relevant for the ecological role that that species plays in nature, right? And, and that is true for bacteria as well. And I think this is making a case for us measuring quantitatively um, the, not just the, the, um, the, the basically to, to measure the, the realized niche, right? And, and to quantify um, how competitive microbes are on, on different carbon sources. If we want to really understand whether a micro will be found or not in a given habitat. And, uh, and that's it. Uh, again, this work was done by the amazing people in the lab. And uh, I think we may still have time for some questions. So um, uh, shoot. Great. Thanks a lot, Alvaro. Uh, so we have time for questions. Yes, there is one from Silvia. Um, yes, hi. I wanted to ask a, a very general question on the patterns that you showed us in the previous lecture and at the beginning, the fact that the functional composition and the family composition are constant. So I was wondering, can we um, compare these patterns with a null model that would tell us that we would expect more variability in the absence of a mechanism that brings this uh, uh, constant, constant? Right. Um, right, yeah, the question is, what would be the null model, right? I mean, like, um, I, yeah, I mean, like it, it, you, you may imagine multiple different null models for community assembly, right? You could have neutral models for community assembly. You could, um, you could assume that uh, all nutrients, that basically that all, all of these uh, species are equally good at eating both all of the nutrients that, you, that we're providing them. Um, so I guess, yes, I mean, it, it, is, it is completely possible to compare the expectation to, uh, to null models, right? Um, if you just sampled randomly, the, like I guess the, the simplest one is that if you say that you sample randomly species from the regional pool and, and put them together, right? And in, in our, um, and, and the question you may ask is then, uh, do you see the patterns that we observe? And the answer that is no, you don't, right? Like there is no uh, family level conservation of any kind. Um, and in fact, depending on what nutrient you add, you're gonna find different, um, different species um, on each, right? So that, that already tells you that, that there is a very strong selection that is shaping uh, the assembly of these communities. Um, and that, that's if you compare this to very neutral models. Um, and then of course, if, you, if you're trying to compare these patterns to other null models, I guess like, like always with null models, right? It, it, the null model will needs to reflect a, a null assumption or a null hypothesis, right? So, um, so you would need to define what that null hypothesis is. And, and then, then and absolutely, you could, you could create a null model that, that predicts what that expectation would be. And, and, and you could quantitatively compare our findings with, with that, yeah, or our, the, the parents we observe with, with that null model. Uh, but for the, one, the very simple ones, which you may imagine is just sim simple, random, uh, randomly drawing ESVs from the original pool um, and asking whether the, the same is, is true. The, the answer is it isn't, right? Uh, we, we have checked and, and that is for sure not the case. But uh, as for other null models, uh, again, the, it, would, it would depend on what the, the, the null hypothesis that you're trying to, to disprove is. Okay, thank you. Uh, great, there is then a question from uh, Kiseok. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the great talk. And my question is when you're constructing the, when you're doing the simulation with the FBA model and the experiments with this metabolic model for like Pseudomonas and Enterobacteriae, do you use like 100 strains for each of these uh, family or like how do you represent the family? Right, so we, we took just models that were uh, well benchmarked that people had um, the, the, in, in, in done a lot of work with before. And so I could, I could send you the list of the models we used if you're curious. Um, they, some of them, they're basically published models by other people that, um, and then we had to just adjust them a little bit to the specific um, environment that we had. Uh, but this was not our models, right? We were taking models from, from other groups and they were not a hundred, I think. The, I can't really remember the actual number for each uh, of the two, 
Um, uh, there, I think the, the total it was around 70 something models, I believe, um, but they weren't uh, equally represented. So I think there were more interactivities than pseudomonads, in fact. Um, and the pseudomonads were not sampling the entire phylogeny of the pseudomonadasia. Uh, so the, there's some degree of, um, of, you know, the, of, of non-homogeneous sampling of the, of the two families in terms of the models, right? We, we focused on, on those metabolic models that they were well benchmarked experimentally before, right? And, oh. and if you want the, the list, I can, I'm happy to, to send it over if you're interested. Thanks. So for the experiments, you did, you did use your um, like different kinds of strains for each family. Right. Right. Oh, okay. right. And, and also they, they, they're not, again, we, we were not trying to sample the entire, um, you know, phylogeny of the Sumonadesia and Terakivisia. Um, we were already biased by those bacteria that came up in our, in our, um, in our communities, right? So we took bacteria that from communities that had assembled in glucose and um, both Sumonadesia and Terakivisia. Um, and uh, we have also, we also did similar experiments with random soil isolates um, that were not in our communities and, and we included them into the, into the set. And, the, and we don't, I'm sorry, we've done another set of experiments. Um, the, the results are not that different, right? So it doesn't seem, that, I mean, there's some, there's some patterns, but, but it's not very obvious that the randomly selected bacteria from soil um, are very different in their patterns of secretion, or even maybe have a slightly lower growth rate um, than than the ones that in our that have been selected on average. But but the patterns of secretion were similar, and we didn't really appreciate any any significant difference. But it's not it is we have not really tried to do a very exhaustive search for enterobacteria or pseudomonadesia to see how conserved they are throughout the entire uh, the entire taxonomic group. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Great, there is a, a question from Martina. Hi, thank you. This was all very interesting. And I have actually two questions, if I can. Uh, one is, uh, how do you, I, I was looking at your plot before, and how you do, do you justify the fact that the pseudomonads don't really have different growth rates in uh, acetate. Um, when you show the different plots. Uh, Let me see and... if I can get your question right. Uh, 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 yeah, sorry. Here? Yeah, yeah. For here, it seems that you have def definitely two strains that grow much better, but they're oh. not really different from one another. Or my getting no, it wrong. Each of is a different strain, right? So each of these yeah. are different strain. Uh, the strains have different 16S, right? So uh, we, we are, we're not even, um, every single one of these has a different, a unique 16S sequence, right? And we did Sanger sequencing for, for the entire region. So it's a high quality sequence. So th they are they are different, all of these strains, yes. No, no, but th my question is, uh, it's not the big difference between uh, enterobacteria and pseudomonads. And that's why I was wondering uh, how then you justify these changes in acetate, uh, even though the growth rate doesn't appear to be completely different. Uh, and while no, it is, it is, no, it, it is, no, but it's, it's different, right? I mean, I think even even if you remove those two strains, the the um, it's statistically significant, right? Um, and is this is just the maximum growth rate? We also find that if you look at the average growth rate, which is not mm -hmm. just the maximum you have. But basically, the counting the lag phase and uh, and how long does it take for them to reach half of the of the maximum growth they have? So the monas also grows better than 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 uh, the yeah. Um, and the same the same thing is true for lactate. I mean, um, even though we're focusing a lot of as an acetate, the uh, concentration of lactate actually is not that. Let me show you here. Um, it's not that much lower, right, from mm -hmm. what we see in acetate. And, and there's more carbon per, so lactic is, lactic is, is more valuable than acetate metabolically, right? So uh, we think it's actually um, something you cannot neglect. And we're now trying to understand exactly how the, it's not just the acid itself, it's a combination of acetate, lactate, and succinate, and other organic acids that together recruit the pseudomonas. Right? So it's not just, it's not just one. And it also is not just the growth rate, right? It's the, I mean, the growth rate is defined, I mean, as you know, the growth rate is 
changes right over the entire growth period. Yeah. And you have on the one hand, the maximum growth rate, which is important, uh, but, but of course that is only sustained for a brief period of time by the entire population, right? And the, how rapidly you, you get out of lag phase and, and the, the average growth rate over that period is also an important parameter. Uh, but you know, just to clarify um, that this, this is statistical significance is not just because of these two guys, right? It's, uh, it's, it's the entire distribution. Um, and this is only reflecting the maximum growth rate, but the same patterns would, would be um, seen if we had, uh, I was showing you the average growth rate over the entire, um, uh, over the, the first, uh, I think until, we, we chunk it until the, the first, uh, I think it's T1 half, right? Until it reaches half of the maximum OD. Okay, and if I can link this to another thing, so I was wondering if these two strains that have higher maximum growth rate are then those that are more abundant in your uh, experiments. And related to this, I was wondering if uh, when you find this convergence, whether it's driven by the most abundant strains, uh, or do you think that uh, this has nothing to do with abundance? No, I mean, like the, okay, so it's a good question. So I, I really don't, I think we have correlated the growth rates and something that we, we've been meaning to do for a while, the, the growth rates uh, of these bacteria in isolation with their abundance in the, at the community level. Um, this is an idea that we've been floating for a while but haven't quite done it yet. Um, although we have all the data, it shouldn't be very difficult to do. Um, the other thing that you brought up that I think is quite interesting is if you look at this data, right, and we, we see there's convergence, there's still a substantial variation, right, uh, among the um, communities, right? There's still yeah. um, uh, variation in the, in the ratio between salmonella and antibacteria. And I absolutely agree that, oh, and in fact, we have some evidence that points to that, right, that which is the identity of the dominant bacterium um, ref, it matter, impacts the actual RF ratio you see. I'm gonna show you some data tomorrow that will cement that point that when we have alternative stable states from the same inoculum, we have, um, we have looked at the specific um, ratio of respirators to fermenter on each one of the two. And depending on, on which is the identity of res respirator, if it's an Pseudomonas or an Alcalidinacea, uh, they don't quite reach the same abundance. There's variation between the two. And I think because these communities are very small, right? So we're still talking about you know, five to 20 species, but most of them are very rare. So um, there's still gonna be a variation on which is exactly the, the pseudomonas you find on each community, right? Um, if these communities were larger, I think all of these things would average out and you would probably have like, more convergence. That would be my guess, but we don't know, right? Um, but because you only have three species, right? Which, which, happens, which one happens to be the dominant member of its uh, taxonomic group? Um, of course, you know, adaptation to the specific dominant carbon source is not the only, uh, the only selective force we have, right? And, and, and all, any other differences, as well as variations on adaptation to our carbon source that we, we also find should matter for this RF ratio. So that's what we're focusing on averages rather than the, the fluctuations, because this is an, an area we haven't yet explored. But I think you strike a very fair point that, that I think it's very likely that if you examined in more detail um, and try to understand the fluctuations around this, this average value and, and that that could be correlated with traits um, of the specific tax that are found in those communities, right? And maybe there, there are correlations between them. We just haven't looked yet. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, great, I don't see uh, any other questions uh, in the chat or in the... Uh, participant link uh, list. So if uh, there are no other questions, well, uh, thanks uh, Alvaro again for the lecture of today. Just to remind that uh, the next lecture by Alvaro is gonna be in two days uh, on Thursday. Um, and uh, uh, so thanks again. And now we uh, are gonna split in uh, 